Hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. Um, here we are, the start of the second section of the second day, uh, monitoring and alerting. Um, to our first talk will be Neil Murphy uh, from Google. I'm sure most of you are familiar with him. He was also one of the editors of the uh, recent book that came out that I'm sure none of you have read. Um, yeah. Um, and so he's going to be telling us about the structure and interpretation of graphs. So please give a warm welcome to Neil. Okay, uh, everyone can hear me? <laughs> Sounds like it, okay. Uh, so before I begin, uh, this is intended to be an, an, an interactive talk, um, as, you'll, as you'll see. Uh, so I will be asking questions and hopefully uh, folks from the audience will respond as well. Uh, generally speaking, uh, there is some background, some complaining, some graphs, and a call to action. Uh, and all the images are licensed for reuse or from Google unless otherwise noted. Uh, probably somewhere around uh, intermediate level. So some of you in the audience will learn something and uh, some of you may not. But hopefully it'll be entertaining anyway. So SRE, um, in one view of the world, it's actually GIE. And not just because in my employer we really like the seventh letter of the alphabet, but more because we're graph interpreting engineers, OK? Um, why do I say that? Because the interpretation of graphs and the structure of graphs is uh, really strongly embedded in very many of the things that we do, alerting, debugging, long-term trend analysis, so on and so forth. Or more or less any question of what the hell is going on with system Y? Um, in fact, we use graphs so much, it's a little difficult to remember why we do this rather than anything else. Um, so, obviously, the primary reason for using a visual representation of information graphs is information density. Um, <clears throat> images today, obviously, potentially very large. Displays today, potentially very large. There are good ways of mapping a lot of data to a pixel or a set of pixels in some programmatic way. We can easily render them with computers. Um, I think also that our processing hardware as humans for visual information is a bit more efficient than sound or e.g. Uh, taste. Can you imagine the bitter taste of an AWS region going down, being beamed directly <laughs> to your neurons if something went wrong? Um, so given our visual hardware, a graph greatly improves the chances of having something uh, obvious in the data, some kind of an anomaly in the data, uh, being spotted by us directly as opposed to actually trawling through or spacing through some long list of time series data. Uh, so there are exceptions to this, but uh, this is broadly the case. And then a key point at the bottom is that the current structure of the, the graphs that we use in the industry very, very broadly, the, the, by far the most common case, arms us with the basic paradigm of change over time. Um, as you'll see, actually, sometimes this is highly appropriate and sometimes maybe less so. OK, so structure of graphs. They go left to right, or thereabouts. They have axes. We have units, dimensions, legend, and so on and so forth. Um, the left to right constraint, which enables us to reason about causality, is also a constraint. It's a key enabler and a key constraint. Um, so graphs can also be, and there's some examples in the, uh, in the background of the, the slide, uh, graphs don't have to be line graphs, they could be smoothed line graphs, or they can be histograms, or they can be stacked, or they can be scatter or bubble or whatever. There's a lot of particular varieties which all subscribe, or generally subscribe, to the basic notion of change over time. Um, one way to reason about this is to think about the data uh, in the absence of any particular visual representation, essentially what we're doing is changing the topology of that data uh, within effectively a 1D representation. I say one-dimensional because as change over time happens, we don't actually have any choice about the x-axis. Um, so it's all about where we're going to put that, the, the data. Um, and the mode, the default uh, representation, is obviously line graphs with linear progression. Uh, and the choice 
that many of us make when we're constructing dashboards or looking at uh, how to respond operationally to things is, what is the best graph to bring out the anomaly in the data? Or what is the best graph to, uh, to show what's going on? So there are graphs and then there, are, then there is the interpretation of the graphs. Um, currently, interpretation of graphs is an art which is made harder by bad design. Um, so let's go through a few examples. Um, hopefully the graphs will succeed in making obvious things obvious from a visual point of view. Uh, the very best graphs make non-obvious things obvious, uh, but most of them, again, by default, just make them slightly less non-obvious. And overall, the thesis here would be that we use these graphs every day, but actually not all of them are suited to the task there that's, that's being uh, uh, laid at their feet, so to speak. There's a lot that could be better, in particular in the land of visual representation, um, the book there, uh, which you can barely see, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information by Edward Tuft, and uh, the information is beautiful, folks, and so on. There's a lot of uh, art out there that we don't actually make use of um, in our uh, general graphing in the industry. Uh, we could actually ask a lot more of those graphs in order to make the non-obvious things obvious. So, uh, see the home sales diagram there on the right-hand side? Why is that image so misleading? Volume, okay, yes, so in fact, the scaling is twice, but the volume is 4x, so it makes it look to our visual hardware as if the growth is actually dramatically more than it in fact is. So, obvious graphs, obvious graphs are obvious. Okay, there's no units, but you can tell what's going on, or well, there, there are units, well, there are percentages, that's not quite a unit, but anyway, we'll get onto that in a moment. Uh, what's going on here? SRE morale. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, so apart from morale, right, even without units or, or meaningful documentation, we can tell that things are going down. Okay, right, maybe it's stock prices or something, I don't know. So. Um, Proportions of something where they are reducing over time and you can approximately see where they hit zero. That is obvious. Fantastic. What else can we see from this graph? Anything else that's notable? That's absolutely right, yep. So there's an outlier. Hey, it took kind of six, seven minutes longer in order to reach zero. That's kind of neat. Um, or another question. Uh, quickly, what do these percentages add up to? There's no way you could know that, right? <laughs> As it happens, it's 206%, but it doesn't really matter. What I'm saying is, is that there are some things that you would actually perhaps like from a graph that sometimes aren't actually in a graph. Um, as it happens, this is traffic across a set of clusters, but it is the, the, the sum question is a question one could reasonably ask for a lot of graphs, hence my next slide. So what's going on here? Failover. Yep, failover, that's, yep, good. Um, okay, so there's a couple of interesting shapes here. Uh, so one of them goes up when the other goes down. Okay, there's some switch from one data center to another data center. The shape isn't exactly the same on the down curve as the up curve, but it's very clearly correlated, obviously. Uh, so we can pretty, we can pretty at least easily see it's a hot, hot failover situation where one DC carries all the work if the other fails. So uh, you'll see also that we're graphing the total. Why are we graphing the total? Yeah, you can see the global trend. And if we didn't have that, uh, what, what questions could we ask of the graph? Or it, it, uh, if we did not have that in the graph, what questions would, be, would we be unable to ask of that graph? Yeah, exactly. So if something craters and then something ticks up a little bit, you don't know 
if that's necessarily because of a, uh, a total traffic fall or because one of the data centers failed or something. It, it's good to, to graph independent verification of the underlying variables, um, if it makes sense. Um, additionally, is there anything else unusual about the graph or anything else you can pull out of just the shape there? <laughs> okay, so there's a difference in the throughput of the data centers, right? So, okay. Which is in itself an interesting fact. Now, okay, there are five lines in this graph. Three lines show the count of tablet servers uh, by cluster in a particular binary version. They're the straight lines and the X cross indicates when the tablet servers were upgraded. Um, so the other two lines show uh, spindle usage. So with that information, could you interpret this graph? Googlers, be, be quiet. <laughs> Non-Googlers, speak up. Yeah, we did an upgrade, it screwed things up. We undid the upgrade and, oh, it didn't get better. But that's all right, like, we'll come back and fix that. Um, but there is definitely a causal relation between these things and you can pick it more or less immediately out of the graph. Um, so this is really the poster child, uh, excuse the metaphor, uh, for the implicit demonstration of causality provided by the left to right ordering of a graph, okay? So, uh, those were the obvious ones. There are some slightly less obvious ones. Uh, <laughs> okay, this is a tough one. Anyone want to take a guess as to what this is? <laughs> there is a, a nice perspective effect going on, I'll give you that, yeah. Any guesses? Sorry, what to say, Bill? Subsampling. Subsampling. Not quite, but uh, while not exactly warm, you're going in an interesting direction. <laughs> Sorry? Monitoring uh, faults. That's always possible. In this particular case, it was an unfortunately correct uh, output. Uh, you can often see things like that in, in restarts and graphs. This is not that. Okay, hint. Big, do you want a, a small hint or a big hint? Small hint. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, most, uh, usually graphs uh, that we deal with conventionally, again, I'm talking about the default mode are things like QPS and latency and stuff like that. This is not one of those. This is, slightly larger hint, a function. <laughs> nope, think, think function. Sorry? Uh, nope. Yeah, sorry, uh, standard deviation curve, infrastructure costs, monitoring fault. Um, actually, if people have suggestions, maybe they could use the mic as well. Um, okay, so I'll, uh, I'll answer it for you now, which is hash of empty string is that number. So, we're graphing where the hashes of a thing go, and if the graph is all over the place, that's totally fine, that's what we want. If it's a single point, that means that null data has escaped in, and we're hashing null data and it goes to a single point. So, um, that is an interesting illustration of the fact that sometimes it's useful to graph things which are not actually direct, um, I wanna say first party numbers, uh, but indirect functions of input in various ways. Um, so, 
from the Essary book. Um, this is a latency distribution graph. Um, by the way, prefer distributions to averages, OK. Uh, this is a log scale graph. Uh, so what does that imply about those spikes up there? Yes, huge, yeah, so, and huge tail latency as well, yeah. Um, what are the real effects of huge tail latency? Yeah, timeouts generally, but also if you have huge tail latency in some uh, capacity constrained back end, the tail latency on that subset can end up growing and taking out that entire slice of the back end service and those having a much bigger impact on your front end service than you thought uh, possible. So tail end latency actually really matters. Um, and that is one of the things that's uh, not necessarily obvious again our, our visual hardware is pretty good, but sometimes we can miss the fact that there's log scale stuff uh, going on. Uh, and if we miss that fact, if we don't know how to interpret the graph correctly, that just looks like kind of linear spikes that nobody would care about, but in fact, we really strongly care about it. Um, anything else? Again, from a, a visual hardware point of view, anything else? Yep, sure, yep, absolutely, change after 10.30. Um, but there, there's, there's nothing else related to uh, causality here. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm really talking about a, a visual... Stacked graph. Stacked graph, yep. Um, yep, well, t total isn't quite the right word, but um, I... I so I would draw your attention to the... Yeah, it looks like 50% is growing, and that can cause the, you know, the spikes to pop. Could be. I didn't think of that, actually. There you go. Um, but the 50th percentile slow growth might cause the spikes um, in the 95th percentile. Actually, I'm talking about the gaps. So here we have, as the diagram says, 50th, 85th, 95th, and 99th percentile. Um, what can you say about the gap between the 85th and 90th and 95th and 99th percentile latency? Because it's a log scale graph, a gap that's smaller at the top of the graph looks, yeah, so again, our, our visual hardware is perhaps leading us into uh, assuming a bunch of stuff which isn't necessarily the case. Okay. <laughs> uh, this one is a little bit difficult without context. Change your toner cartridge? <laughs> Change your toner cartridge, no. Um, uh, it looks a little bit like uh, cotch dust or some kind of fractal. Um, no, nice try, good, fire graph. Um, it's actually a very, very clever graph, and uh, part of why it's so clever is because the sheer amount of data it attempts to summarize. So this is storage uh, write failure events on some hardware. Now, as you can well appreciate in any kind of uh, sizable enterprise business or cloud business or whatever, there's going to be a lot of storage events, and there's going to be a lot of storage events, uh, most of whom, or most of which work out, and some of which do not work out. Um, so, let's fill in some of the details. X-axis is uh, time as usual, and it actually doesn't really matter what length of time it's over. Um, as long as it's long enough. The key question is, we thought we were seeing increased uh, storage write failure events um, in this particular cluster. So we're asking ourselves, is it hardware? Is it software? What's going on? Um, then we, um, a guy called Balashles, had the inspired idea of ordering the graph by serial number of the hardware. 
So what does that tell you? Yep. Okay, so this very, very clearly shows some banding in the failures uh, which you get when you group by the serial number. Um, now, that's all very well, but then you look at the uh, item, or the, you look at the band at the bottom, and uh, you see some more failures there, which are uh, more than the ones with the, the, ones with the very, uh, uh, the, the penultimate serial numbers. So what might be going on there? Uh, yeah, you could have a you could have bad batches. Um, actually, it kind of doesn't matter what it is. Um, that structure will will or that graph presentation will bring out the structure in the data. What's going on is that after some of the units fail, you send them back in to be repaired, and then they're given a new serial number, and then that looks newer than the older ones. So. The very nice thing about this graph is that although it's dust, like it's literally a scattering of red pixels over the page, it nonetheless uh, provides a really cool way of representing the data uh, and the storage events, which again are going to be incredibly numerous um, in any sizable provider, in a visually interesting way. Okay? <laughs> so. Any ideas about this one? Fish. <laughs> Fish. <laughs> I found Dory. Yes, I found Dory. Um, it's not a snake either. Down sampling? Um, so. Sorry, I didn't hear you? Offers? Oh, okay. Um, uh, not actually buffers, but you're, you're getting warm. Caching? Uh, no, but also, like, it, no, rate limits. Rate limits. Uh, not quite. So, what happens? What happens when you? Um, <laughs> what happens when you remove uh, an RPC method that a client didn't want removed? You get retries. Okay, so. This is retry behavior when we're deprecating something. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, so the client retry behavior is, well, I'll just try a bit harder. No, I'm going to try harder again. Nope. I know you're saying no, but what you really mean is, et cetera. Uh, so this is. Uh, <laughs> and all of those things we wrote in the book, yes. It would show exponential back off. Um, but in fact, the, the, the client was a little underspecified in this case and uh, ended up engaging in, I think it's called underdamping uh, behavior. Um, so the, the clients had weird behavior. Wimbledon? <laughs> a graph of where the tennis balls land in Wimbledon. Uh, no, but it is beautiful. <coughs> Festus, yes. <laughs> no falling in a ball pit. Um, okay, so uh, what if I told you that the left hand side was, or that the, the units were, was latency? Any ideas? Sorry, could you use the mic? Didn't hear you? Yeah. Okay, load balancing. Um, yep, so uh, changed load balancer behavior. I wonder if you can tell when that happened. <laughs> um, so that's the obvious bit. Fine. What's the non obvious bit? Non obvious is. Sorry, speak up. There was a lot of servers underutilized and a lot of 
Uh, exactly right. So um, the load balancing change pushed everything into a narrower band of, of latency distribution, but at the cost of taking samples that were underneath, um, that were latency zero or uh, close, um, and uh, raising those up. So it raised the floor and shrank the ceiling, um, but it isn't necessarily easy from this graph to tell uh, whether the samples that do better under the new regime outweigh the samples that do worse. Okay. So, first part is a graph showing QPS over days. Totally fine, okay, there's some kind of mistake about a seventh of the way in, well, that's fine. Um, what might be hiding in that data? I'll do a zoom in in the moment. And a camel. A camel. <laughs> Possibly. Something is hiding in the data. Yes, that is absolutely true. Um, geographical origin. Geographical origin. Not quite. Let's zoom in a little bit more. Over 12 hours. Every hour, every hour there is a spike. Okay, so there is client-side synchronization, which is visible on the one hour mark, which is not visible on the daily graph. So this is a, uh, a reminder that the resolution of your graph really strongly matters and that there are certain periods over which you will see things that are invisible on other periods, other aggregations. Okay, so I think overall, what I would say is from visual anomaly detection point of view, hey, humans are actually pretty good. We made a lot of progress in that session. Um, admittedly, uh, some of those were tough, sort of took, uh, took us a good deal of time to figure out what was going on. Um, but I do have a, a set of recommendations for when you're constructing your graphs. Um, so graphing totals can highlight subtle behaviors. Um, it actually, more useful than, than you might at first assume. Um, log scale is really useful as well, uh, especially for latency. That's a per particularly apposite application of log scale, but it can also lead you strongly astray particularly if you have a bunch of graphs which are linear, a log scale graph, and then a bunch of graphs which are linear, then uh, it can be sometimes difficult to remember that that's the exception. Um, in general, prefer distributions to averages because of the information hiding point I was making earlier. Um, and speaking of information hiding, hierarchies of resolutions um, are, are relevant to debugging are relevant to long-term trending and figuring out what's going on generally. Um, your particular monitoring package, graphing package, um, might make it easier or harder to line up similar time frames, but one of the advantage of the implicit causality uh, bias provided by the graphing structure we have today is that the later than relationships are really obvious. So if you can line up similar periods, um, periods of graphs, you should do that. Um, of course, choose the right, the right graph type, whether it be a gauge, rate counter, whatever. Um, sorting, which is not necessarily a, a natural uh, first order uh, concept in Graphing and dashboarding can also be unexpectedly powerful. Um, remember the hardware serial number sorting case. Um, and also graphing functions. Uh, and not just rate of functions, but harder things like hashes. Um, starting your graphs at zero <laughs> is also euro, or euro is also useful. Um, there are a bunch of people who are into y-axis zero fundamentalism, um, and we should, we should honor that. Uh, don't lie with your charts, generally. Um, 
But again, left to right causality is, is blinding us to perhaps some otherwise useful representations. Which brings me to the second point of the talk, which is um, I, I do think we need to move to better visualizations or at least a wider range of visualizations which are easier to use. Um, I do know about Grafana um, and the excellent work being done by um, many people in the monitoring space. Like I, I've, I have confidence we will get there. The hosted Graphite folks, Prometheus folks, and so on. Um, that's not going to stop me complaining, because uh, I am who I am. Uh, so, oh, sorry, that didn't blow up so well, but um, here's an example of an interesting visualization, which is not a left to right uh, causality presentation. It's a thing called a population pyramid, which allows you to compare one population on the left-hand side with the, the total population on the right-hand side. So this is a great graph um, of the proportion of the population by um, community. It shows you three things almost immediately. What are those things? Young people. Yeah, that's interesting. So what's going on with that? Sorry. Life expectancy is low. Yeah, so. Yes, I agree. However, sorry? Yes. Yes, it's age distribution at, at one point. Strictly speaking, it tells you nothing. However, um, <laughs> I used to manage uh, in my day job uh, a pipeline-based big data system. And one of the problems that we had was that this data would go through various transformations in various steps. Okay, so enter stage one, exit stage one, and so on. One of the ways that this uh, was difficult to debug was because line-based graphs for stage representation actually were not intuitive and not easy to parse. Um, so one potential way around this is to have a graph which shows you what the historic distribution per stage is and shows you what the point in time distribution at this moment is so that if you get stuck in your 40s, then you can immediately pull that out of the graph. And again, it's useful because it's decoupled from time. Um, I expect that that is almost unreadable to most of you, but um, this is a Sankey diagram, S-A-N-K-E-Y, with an Irish connection here. Um, so Sankey diagrams are flow diagrams where the proportion of stuff, whatever the stuff is, in this case I think it's steam or maybe heat, um, is sized according to the amount of stuff going from uh, unit A to unit B. In other words, if 100% of stuff is going from here to here, then you're like that. If 50% goes, you, you break it in two and uh, put it into the two different destinations. Um, this is from Irish Captain Matthew Henry Phineas Real Sankey, uh, who had a long name. Uh, and used this diagram in 1898 um, in a figure showing the energy efficiency of a steam engine. Um, so this is also useful because in many diagrams that we have uh, in our industry, we are showing packets or data or bytes or something going from some place and to multiple other places and often from a line graph it's not immediately clear what exact proportion of this stuff is going at different stages, whereas a diagram like this is a bit easier to figure out immediately. 
Um, so, heat map. Okay, so in this case, it's uh, salinity of the sea surface, um, rapidly going one way or the other. Uh, the term heat map, I'm compelled to tell you, was originally coined and trademarked by software designer Cormac Kinney in 1991. Um, it is a very useful way, uh, particularly on a geolo ge geographical basis, to tell where things are concentrated, where events are concentrated, where the maximum possible change is taking place, um, or otherwise pull out areas of the data which are more relevant than other areas. Anyone come across this before? Yeah, okay, so this is a, a rendering of the American Electoral College such that the size of the state, the geography, is proportional to the votes provided. Yes, Kaski? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. Uh, if you don't do this, if you don't use a proportional uh, representation, um, and you use a standard map, you get a false impression about, an intuitive impression about the number of votes provided by uh, uh, the state. Um, or about the country by person as opposed to the um, country by surface area, so to speak. So, I'm gonna party like it's 2009. <laughs> tag cloud. So this is not a graph, okay? This is a tag cloud for outages. What can you tell immediately? Hey, there's lots of bugs. <laughs> what a surprise. Um, so, I, I guess that's, a, again, a pretty uh, somewhat superficial but an immediate way to tell roughly with our visual hardware and linear comparisons what the size of the relevant categories of error that we deal with every day in this particular team. Um, we could maybe use some more accurate categorization, but overall it gives you a rough idea of the things um, that we wrestle with and how difficult or wh where our effort would be best spent if we were attempting to drop the number of alerts. And we're done. Q&A. Any cues? If no cues, then no A's. <laughs> All right. Thanks, folks.